be here, Lord, and whatever needs to be said, I pray that it is said, and whatever needs to be connected, I pray that it connects. Thank you, God, for everything you are to us. Amen. Okay. Um, okay. So thank you for inviting me here. Um, every time a church invites me to speak, I'm always both uh, happy and also surprised. I do a lot of speaking outside of churches. Um, so I rarely get to speak in a church setting. Uh, which is always very funny. Um, so if you asked me outside, uh, like, what do I do for work? Uh, my LinkedIn introduction would sound something like, I'm a cultural change strategist, which is a very fancy way of saying, I work with people, leaders, and organizations, and I teach them the thinking and social and emotional skill sets that they need to create the change that they want to see. And that change could be in their relationships, it could be in their family, it could be business, it could be everything. Because whatever it is, it's just people. Yeah. It's people that you're working with, right? What I rarely get to say in a secular setting, though, is what, uh, why I do the work that I do. Um, the core identity, if you like, that I operate from when I do my work is I'm a child of God. And I was not born in a Christian family. I converted only in university. And I think since that time, when I was 20, for some reason, the idea of a ministry of reconciliation and bridge building has always appealed to me. Um, so, you know, the funny thing is, I never thought of my work... Okay, when I read the Bible and I see verses like, or, you know, set the prisoners free and help the blind see and help the lame walk. I always saw it as like physical healing and that's like not relevant for me. It's like, I don't know, I, I, I don't have the physical healing magic powers. <laughs> Some people have it, I don't. Uh, but I think it's recently where I got the perspective from God that uh, in a way the work that I do is about helping people to see. Yeah. And yeah and help them to walk out of prisons of their internal making. Yeah, so that's what I do for work. And the reason why you're also seeing this like uh, Sunship picture is also, um, Sunship was a, was a small independent church community that I was in uh, during the pandemic years. Uh, and it was one that folded up during the pandemic. Uh, and me and my husband are sort of like working for a very small group of people to figure out what's the next steps. And my interest in it is because I think more and more as I see the broken things that happen around me and to people, I think it cannot be healed unless we really help people to understand that you are nothing but a child of God. You are a son and you are a daughter and you are okay. So... I'm slightly emo because the worship, right? I don't know what like what like uh, koyok you put in it, right? But <laughs> and that, that, that's why I'm very sure God and Holy Spirit and all that's in the room because Amen. there was something about it that I don't know. It deeply touched me. Um, so that's why I think He's here and He has work to do. Uh, I structured my sharing in three simple ways. Um, I and as I as I talk up here, I don't want to see it as I'm like a pastor preaching to you, right? I take it as this is what three big things that I have learned along the way. And as I close each part, um, I'm hoping to facilitate a conversation between God and you on that. So the, I thought about what would be the three things. Uh, I'm a big fan of Tim Keller and his three-point sermons. So... <laughs> How might we be peacemakers for each other? I think for me it comes down to this. The first is to allow God to reparent you so that you can operate from a place of deep, true peace. The second thing is to prioritize having a purity of heart over having peace, with quotation marks, so that you can, as you make peace, you will 
be truly at peace with what you are doing. You can see God, you can experience wholeness. You don't feel like you're shortchanging yourself because you've chosen the path of peace. I think that's very important. And the third thing I will talk about is how can you plan for peace and how can you practice peace so you can live peaceably with all so far as it depends upon you. So let's talk about allowing God to reparent you, which is a very strange uh, word. And let me just check with the room. How many of you have seen this word reparent before? Just want to check. Okay, just one. All right, wonderful. We're all going to get a small little education today. <sighs> okay. One of the most poetic ways I have heard describe the human condition uh, is this. Uh, we are all born into this world looking for the face that is looking for us. What that means is, so I have a, I have a little girl, and so those of you who are parents in the room can probably resonate with that, but when, when a child is born, uh, they come out screaming and like, what the heck? <laughs> like, what, 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 what just happened to me, right? And, and, and the nurses are trained to take that child and whatever they do, all the weighing and all that, right? But they must, as quickly as possible, put that child onto the mother for skin-to-skin -skin contact so that eye-to-eye -eye contact also is first established, right? And the, for healthy development of any child, any human being, um, you have to connect very early on with a face that is looking for you. That there is someone who wants to relate to you, to make things safe for you, to comfort you, and you feel this deep sense of, I belong to someone in this world. I belong to you, you belong to me, and I am safe. So this early experience, right, I belong to you, I'm safe with you, I'm at peace with you, that's the ideal, right? It should have been your first early parent figures, right? And we are all born into imperfect families. Some parents knew how to connect better than others, right? So this shot that you see is taken from a famous... Uh, experiment called the still face experiment. And what you see is a mother being very, very delighted with her young child. And you can see the delight on the parent's face evokes a delight in the child. The child is not logical yet. The child is not rational yet. The child is just immediately responding to this, I like you, you like me. Ah, life is wonderful, right? I'm so at ease with the world. And the thing about this experiment, and you should watch the whole thing, right, is, so in the experiment, what she does is, the, the mother is told, just play it like normal, and then she will turn away, and then suddenly she will like, still face, right? And it is the most painful thing to watch because you see very quickly, so at first the kid is in complete joy and safety, right? And then the kid goes into confusion. The kid's like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, what is this like monster face going on, right? And you can see the, 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 the difference between the, the parent's face, which is full of delight, and the parent, which is, I don't even want to give you any, any sign that I care for you. The confusion quickly becomes appeasement. The child starts to reach out and try and get your attention. And then it becomes distress. Like, I cannot take this anymore. And... In this experiment, and, and very quickly it stops, so it's only like a, one or two minutes, but it's very painful to watch. Right? Then the mother like, puts back her normal face again, and the child is like, <laughs> right? And it's like, thank goodness, this is just an experiment, and the mother can go back to her normal kind of relationship. But what this thing shows is, if you, exper if you experience, so you can see that even in a moment of disconnection, it is physically, even emotionally, like, Painful. It's really, really painful. So imagine if you were subjected to persistent distance or persistent disconnection. So, and if that was your experience, it was a hard thing to do. It was a hard thing to go through, right? So you might have developed deep pain, deep insecurities, and deep coping mechanisms to, just to cope. And you were a kid. It wasn't your fault. 
right? So the thing is, and this is what I teach in secular settings, and it immediately opens up a lot for people, right? So what does it mean to be insecure? And why am I starting with this when we talk about peace? It's very, very hard to be a person of peace if you've never experienced what peace means. And I want to give you words to understand why is it so hard for some of us to experience peace and security and love and belonging. Because if you look at this, right, on the top, if you have a fundamental positive story of self, and let's keep it simple as I am okay, I am deeply fundamentally okay, I have less anxiety in my life. But if I come from a, let's say, a long, persistent story of there's something wrong with me, I'm not okay, something wrong with me, then you'll experience anxiety. Now, and this could be a story that was reinforced by parents or early friends or whatever. And if you put this on another axis, right, where on one end you have a positive story of other people, other people are okay, they're good, right? I can love and trust and connect with people, right? you will have less avoidance in your life. You don't avoid people. But if you have a negative story of other people, that's what you were brought up in, or that's what you started to believe from young on, um, then you will avoid people a lot. Now, obviously, this is the one we all want to be in. I am fundamentally okay. You are fundamentally okay. Now, I'm okay, you're okay, doesn't mean it's a care bear, naive, like, yeah, yeah, everyone okay one. It's not, not, okay? It means... I'm okay enough, it's not just about I feel confident, I feel secure, but I'm okay enough to take this criticism. I'm okay enough to talk to you even though you disagree with me. I will be okay. Your criticism is not an attack on me. I know who I am. Your criticism is your criticism, and I can hear it without feeling damaged. And you are okay enough that if you did something wrong, I can hold you accountable. Because I believe you're okay enough to hear this. You're okay enough to take responsibility. So that's what I'm okay, you're okay means, okay? So if you're in that quadrant, you have very healthy, clear boundaries, and you feel a healthy peace inside you, and you can do peace with other people in a very stable manner because you know how to trust, connect, and communicate in a healthy way. Now, as you're listening to this, don't feel like depressed and, okay, I'm not there. <laughs> All right, I'm not there, okay? So in most studies, what they've discovered is most people are in these two quadrants. Most of us. All right? So let's talk about that, that one. In this combination, I believe other people are okay. So I don't avoid people. That's not my issue. But because I believe I'm the one who's not okay, then what I have is a lot of anxiety. I don't avoid you, but I'm very anxious inside all of the time. And so some of you may look very peaceful, very sweet, very like, hi, can I like cook chakwe tiao for you? But inside, very anxious, because if you reject my chakwe tiao, I'll feel very sad. Why you don't? Oh, yeah, that, that kind, okay? Right? So, and, and I know you're laughing, and some of you are like, hey, don't laugh at me, leh. Right? Okay? Now, and, and I want to name that I have these issues too. So I say it with a lot of empathy, okay? Um, but in that space, at your very worst, you can be codependent. You can have so much self-doubt. And because you self-doubt, but other people better than you, you want to please them, you want to cling on to them, everything I will do for you, but, and then if you don't like it, I'll be unhappy with you. Right? So it's a deep story. And this is a story. It's a story that other people are okay, and I'm the one who's not okay. Let's look at the other combination. Right? And I want you to understand this because sometimes this gets married to this. Or this makes friends with this. Okay? So in this space, I'm okay. I'm fine. Other people are the problem. Right? So if you're in that space, it is also a kind of insecurity. It is also a space of not feeling at peace with yourself. Because in that space, you can be dismissive, you can be detached, you can be cool. What's your version of peace? It's, oh, you got a problem with me? That's okay. I don't have to be friends with you. Bye. 
right? <laughs> you know, I have no issues with people because I don't have friendships, right? All right, so uh, you will, because you struggle and you struggle with intimacy, you struggle being vulnerable, you struggle with just having a healthy relationship with people, but you have very strong boundaries. So your issue is not codependency. You're at peace because you don't have relationships. And the other one's at peace because they just like compromise everything that they care about. So it's important that we, and I think as Christians, understand, is this the story that you grew up with? Is that the story you were brought up in? Right? And I won't talk too much about this one, but some people do come from this space. And this is the space where people struggle the most with addiction, with very strange behaviours, because imagine that double whammy of, I'm not okay, other people not okay, so why should I do anything? There's no reason for me to do good in this world, there's no reason for me, but at the same time, I want people, but then when they come to me, I want to do strange things to them. So, I want the connection, but when you connect with me, I will reject you. Right? So, it is not healthy. Right? So, this is secure, insecure, insecure, insecure. If you like, deep sense of peace, not really at peace, not really at peace, super not at peace. Right? And this is just to raise your awareness that this is what people are dealing with. This is what you are dealing with. This could be what your person that you're trying to be at peace with is dealing with. And when you recognize that, it's not to excuse it, but it's to understand it. This is where people are coming from. So, let's go back to, so we're born into this world looking for the face that is looking for us, that's saying, you're okay. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's like go and do this world in this secure, peaceful manner. Right? And if you were raised not in that way, and then you go out into the world, and then you march up, see people this kind of face, right? Like, tell me how many like degree you have, huh? No degree, yeah. Like, how much money you got? Ah, so little, lah. Wow. Then inside, right? You feel even more painful. Like, wow, this place, this world is horrible, right? Why everyone treat me like I'm not okay like that? So if if you keep seeing these faces that are not looking for you, you're going to struggle to feel deep security and peace inside. And so it's no wonder that you walk around the world feeling like. Why should I be at peace with anyone? No one wants to be at peace with me, so I'm going to be at war with others. And so you cannot give peace if you don't have peace. You cannot give people what you do not have. Right? If I don't understand the experience of peace and love and safety and connection, I can't give it out. And this is not a criticism for those of you who that was just not the richest that you had in your own family. And let's acknowledge that, right? So, what do we do? So if you go to the secular world, one of the answers that psychotherapy will give you, right, is this thing called reparenting. Reparenting simply means, okay, a lot of damage was done to you in the early years, fine. It's either a therapist or you yourself tries to be that rich honest, reliable, safe, comforting parent that you never had, right? Now, it's clear what's the problem, right? One of, so it, it, is, it is a reasonable form of uh, treatment, but one of the limits is in reparenting, the therapist could also have their own problem, right? <laughs> it's true, right? By the way, uh, if you go to a therapist, if you and the therapist not really working out, you can break up with them, it's okay, go and find a better one, right? It's not that, wow, they're therapists, so I cannot break up with them, right? But the therapist themselves may not know how to do it. And you yourself, is like, I'm not even sure how do I reparent myself again. I'm 30, 40 years old, what does it mean to parent myself again? And it's in that context that I want you to see the good news that is before you. You already have someone who has offered to reparent you. Yeah. Amen. He's saying like, look, if you have received the true light, the word made flesh, the Son, Jesus Christ, if you've received me and you believed in my name, I give you the right to become a child of God. You see, God's not there to say, okay, Let's take your IC and then we tear it up, okay? You're no longer the child of your mother and father. No, no, no. God honors that. 
God also wants to reparent your parents, right? But God said, I'm not here to replace your parents, right? But I'm here to tell you, you have the right to become my child. And that is how gentle he is. He's not saying like, oh, now I kidnap you, uh, you are my child, okay? <laughs> like, come, come, listen to me. He's saying, I give you the right. It's here. You want or not, you know? And this definitely relates to peacemaking because blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. So the good news is God has already offered, like, look, whatever that happened, like, I'm here for you, right? I can heal you. The bad news is we may not have taken up his offer yet. So it's a bit like sometimes, you know, your friends say, hey, I got like some free ticket, go watch concert, right? I give you the right to go to the concert. And you're like, and you forget. Then like, oh, yeah. <laughs> should I go, should I not go, whatever, yeah. So sometimes when it's given like that too freely, right? A bit like, really, me, <laughs> you know? Um, and I don't want you to take that lightly. When you first convert, and I'll say when I first became a Christian, no one sat me down to say, like, look, do you know what it means to be a child of God? No, it was like, okay, you say the sinner's prayer. Ah, now you're Christian already. Yay. <laughs> you know? So it's like, okay, what is it? Then it, the, the, the conversation is always how to be a Christian, how to be a better Christian. And it's not that that's wrong. It's like, but there's such a missing conversation of what does it mean to be a child of a parent who knows what it means to love you. And can you believe that that is available for you? That you don't have to go around feeling like, oh man, I wish I had a better parent, I wish I had a better family. It is what it is. And now you have God here. What does it mean for you to see Him as the face that is looking for you? He is looking for you, the eyes of God are upon you. Amen. And it is not eyes of like, you're not okay, man. <laughs> you know? It's eyes that are saying, kid, you're okay. You're okay. I see everything that you have gone through. I see your mistakes. I see your intentions. And imagine the very, very best kind of parent. What would they say to you? And if you, in your humanity, can imagine what a very good human parent would say to you, what more does God the Father want to say to you? If you made a mistake, what would a loving, powerful, truthful, honest Father say to you? And if you haven't given yourself that chance, before I move to my second point, I'd like you to invite you to just close your eyes for a while. Just close your eyes for a while. I want you to imagine now that God is here. Where do you think He is in this room with you? I want you to imagine that He's looking at you. He is the face that has always looked for you. And I want you to dare to look back. What is he saying to you? What does he want you to feel? And as you're imagining God with you, parenting you, loving you, telling you you're okay, I want to invite you to imagine what if that was true? That as long as I'm in Him and with Him, I am okay, and I will be okay.
I'm going to let you say whatever you need to say back to him. And I'll let you continue your conversation with him later. Yeah, he's with you. I'm going to invite you to open your eyes. And I want you to see that it's not about, wow, got smoke machine, got music, and then suddenly like God will appear, kind of thing. I want you to see it looks as every day as that. Like, God, are you here? Let me try and imagine you. What's the face that you're looking at me with? And I'm going to challenge you that if you think God's looking at me with this like, whoa, you cannot make it kind of eyes, right? <laughs> then slow yourself down and ask, is that really God? Yeah. yeah. Check. Now, let's go on. My second point here is prioritize having purity of heart. And I know that looks very weird. Huh? Purity. Since how come purity? I thought we were just talking about peace. Okay? This comes about because I was reading these verses. And let me read the first one. See, in Romans it says, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Which means in Romans it already says, Peace is not going to be this like sha la la land. Okay? It's not going to be like, yeah, I'm like, you're going to get along with everyone. It's always going to be fine. It says, as far as possible, as far as it depends on you, you can only take responsibility of your own responses. You cannot control them. On you, try and live peaceably with all, but not everyone's going to be at peace with you. And that's their thing, not your thing. All right? And for those of you who struggle with the, but I'm not okay, they are okay, you're going to feel this is really hard because it must be me. It must be my fault. If they are reacting like that, I cannot take it. You have to recognize some people are just fundamentally not at peace. And you cannot let they are not at peace disturb your sense of peace. Right? So, but if possible, live peaceably with all. And I want to match this with James. When in James chapter 3, it says the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. You cannot be peaceable first, then look at purity. And the challenge is, what does purity mean? Right? What is this? Right? So God desires for us to be at peace and to be peacemakers, but he doesn't mean at the cost of purity of heart. No. So what does that mean? So what does that mean? Right? If you look at Matthew, the verse just before, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Just before that, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, in heart for they will see God. So it's purity first, then peace. right? Now, and if you look at James, after that first pure and peaceable line, right, it says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, or cleanse your hands, and you sinners, and purify your hearts, you men of double mind. What that means is purity of heart has something to do with single-mindedness, with single-heartedness, right? with the pursuit of God. So it's not, okay, be at peace with everyone, okay? Just try, try, try damn hard to be at peace with people. It's no, first you seek God, seek His face. What does God want to say to you? And let Him seek you. Let Him say the words of truth and love that you need to feel secure. Do that first. Don't rush to like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Do that work first. What does God want to say to me? Connect with that. Purify your heart and mind. Then seek peace. So sometimes our peacemaking efforts aren't, uh, aren't built on healthy foundations, right? So remember that I'm not okay, you're not okay, that kind of thing, right? So if that's your issue, if you go into peacemaking, it might make things worse, right? So if you recognize, okay, I've got some of these struggles and I've got this issue with this person, my first step is go to God with, hey God, you know this one is my perpetual struggle. Lah. Okay? So I want to seek your face. Tell me, Father, what should I do? Tell me, Father, what do you want to say to me? Right? And don't like, hey, Father, tell me what to do, like your yeah, servant, like that. Okay, it's, Father, I've got a problem. 
And I want you to imagine that this is a father who is not just loving you, but he's also very truthful and has the highest integrity. And you can trust him to say things to you that you might be like, whoa, I need to say that to that person? Okay, but check with the father first, right? Now, so let's explore a little bit more about what the pure heart or pure mind means, right? So in the psalm, it says that a pure heart does not lift up the soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. So sometimes when we go out to try to make peace with people, right, we are not being honest. We might be seeking peace on the basis of dishonesty. That means I'm not going to tell you what I am struggling with. I'm not going to tell you the truth of what's going on. But let's just have peace. Peace, right? And you know that's false because if you have, okay, I'm now at peace with this person, but every day you're still thinking about it, you're still like not at peace about it, it means maybe it wasn't pure. There wasn't a purity of truth of the mind or truth of the heart of what it was that you were going through, right? So there's this pastor called John Piper, and I looked up this like 1987 sermon that he did, right, on blessed are the pure in heart, and I thought he captures this really well. He says, a pure heart is a heart that has nothing to do with falsehood. It is painstakingly truthful and free from deceit. Deceit is what you do when you will, when you want two things and not one thing, right? So, and I thought this was very, very stark. If you get into a let's say, a conversation with someone and you're doing one thing and you hope that people think you're doing another or you feel one thing and then you say stuff so that people think you're feeling something else, that is double-mindedness, right? That is double-mindedness or that is double-heartedness and that is impurity of heart. And you might think like, huh, why you say me like that, right? I'm just trying to be nice here, all right? God doesn't want you to be nice. Nice, okay, let's... If I can put it into a very clear principle of, for you here, when you try and make peace with someone, right, your job is to be clear, that means to be truthful, and to be kind, which means you can put your truth down in a kind way. But don't be nice, especially if nice for you means let's be really dishonest about what I'm really thinking and feeling. So be clear, be kind, but don't be nice. And part of the problem with like, Let's, ooh, let's just be peaceful people, right? Is sometimes we mix it up. We think peaceful people means let's be nice people. And nice means like, oh, so are you still angry with me? No, darling, I'm not angry with you. <laughs> and then 10 years later, by the way, right? Like, I thought you said you're not angry with me. Or worse, when you're like, hey, what's wrong? You should know. Like, huh? How am I supposed to know? I can't read your mind, right? But <laughs> you see, you all laugh because you can recognize yourself in it, right? See, we are all in good company here. We are we're all struggling with this, right? And I want to encourage you that you might have been raised to believe I cannot be truthful with what I'm thinking and feeling because if I do, then they will hate me or they will make noise with me or no la, women don't want to know the truth, right? Or like, no, men don't want to hear it. Now, don't tell yourself such lies. Don't tell yourself such lies. It's like God is a God of truth. God is pure in that sense. But you see, truth without love is damaging, of course. So the principle, like, okay, then it's like, so do I just say all my truth, right? Uh, The principle I love to teach people is the harder the truth you got to deliver, then the greater the love you must offer. If you want to offer a very hard and difficult truth to someone, then match it with a good love. Truth and love come together. So if you are loving without the truth, then that's not love. That's just called being nice. And you can see some churches terribly damaged by nice people. Like, hi! I should tell you what she did to me. That's not, that's not kind. That's not loving. So truth, and this is something that we struggle with. Can I be honest? 
Can I be wholehearted with what I really think and feel? Is it okay to say things which are a little bit scary and risky to say? Like, like even among like friends, like, can I tell you, hey, when you said that, that wasn't okay. When you said that, I got a bit upset. Can I talk to you about it? I'm like, huh? No one lah, not nice lah. Your job is not to be nice, people. Your job is to be loving and truthful. Don't be nice, okay? Peace, true peace, can never ever be founded upon falsehood, deceit, denial, or double-mindedness. It just can't, right? So sometimes it deeply, deeply troubles me when I talk to married friends who are like, we have no marital problems. But then, right, their peace ah, is fake one. Then you're like, Stop it, stop it. Right? You almost be like strangling some of them and they are Christians. You want to like shake them. And like, why are you pretending that you have problems? Like, like you as if you have no problems like that. Don't. Because if the longer you pretend, one day that peace will fall apart. And that's how people one day wake up and think, huh? You want to divorce me? Since when? Since many, many years. That person just never tell you only. Only tell you like when I want to say bye bye. Oh, this is so damaging. It is so horrible. Like, don't do this to people. Give people a chance to make repairs. Let them know, right? And if that's you, like, like that's I got so much to say after so many years, right? Can me? Yes, can. Say now. Say now before it's too late. Because once you reach a tipping point of there's so much. I got 30 years of terrible things to tell you, right? By then, I'm very sien already. Like, I have whatever. Divorce you easier. (laughs) So don't do that. Don't do that. Right? Peace must be founded upon a purity of heart and mind. I am going to be purely truthful with you. And I will pick wisely what truths to put on the table from time to time. It doesn't mean like, nah, here, these are all my problems, right? It's like people cannot take that much information. Just one at a time, preferably in the moment. If in the moment, literally, your husband says something that you don't like, right? And my my dear husband sitting on the first row, we literally did that yesterday. If in the moment, I have an issue with tone, he thinks tone is not a problem. Right? Now, we could say, hey, it's a small thing, let me hide it. But if I don't like it, I will just say, because I feel the break of peace. We're not at peace with each other. I'm not at peace. Right? It's not like a huge issue, but in that moment, I can feel I cannot relate to you with integrity, pretending like everything is okay. There's a part of me that feels a little not okay right now. And it's, I'm not going to say, hey, a small thing. I'm going to just say, hey, I didn't like that. And then we talk about it. And we talk about it as honestly as we can. And then that's it. It's gone. Now can go and watch movie. Happy, right? But imagine if I like, no lah, no lah, small thing, small thing, small thing, small thing, small thing, small thing, and then watch the whole movie like. (laughs) And then later, midnight, wasn't that a good movie, darling? Actually, can I talk to you what happened three hours ago? Then you're like, (laughs) where is this coming from? Got it? Right? So, and I want to give you a more serious example. So I'm giving you the everyday example, but I want to share with you the serious example that I see happening in churches as well. Right? Um, I won't go too much into this woman's story. Uh, Look her up. But to me, she is a great example of how do you be a person of peace even though, like, you have gone through so much and you're surrounded by so much, like, falsehood around you. So, she was part of a like she, had an, she was part of an early church community. She went through abuse there. The church covered it up. And then as a kid, and later on, she was one of 250 young girls who were abused by this, like, uh, by this like, uh, doctor. It was a very famous case in the US. And how she became really famous was because at the trial, she gave a speech about forgiveness and justice. Right? And... I thought it was interesting because she pointed out how, like, look, this guy who abused 250 people still had the cheek to go to the court and then carry a Bible and say, like, oh, oh, everyone should forgive me right now. And she was saying, like, look, um, truth is important, right? Truth is important because you're going to be tempted many times. And she was saying the church community, the community of gym people and all that, 
lots of people in the world, and even in the church, will be tempted or pressured to keep the peace because they don't want to deal with a lot of like dark and damaging things, and it's not fun to deal with it. And she's saying, but if we don't tell the truth to the world of what has happened, right, the truth of what you have experienced, the truth of what is okay and not okay, then you can, people cannot feel hope. There is no hope without truth. So what I found very striking about this woman's story is she's saying, like, look, like, it is the purity of truth that gives people the light. Right? When the world is very, very dark, right, you need like, truth so that people can do real justice, they can extend real forgiveness, they can feel real grief. It is real peace that sets people free. False peace traps people. Right? So I don't want to do, go into most of the story, but this is the line that I really wanted you to get. That how do I know if the peace I have is real? How do I know if like, my being at peace, am I really at peace with this person? Look at it, do you feel free? Do you feel free or not? If you don't feel free, then there is a truth that has not been said. You need to speak out the truth that can set you free. Right? And not in this free kind of thing, but you feel, I can move on. I'm not trapped in the past. I'm not trapped in anger. I'm not trapped in unhappiness. I said the thing that needed to be said. So it is a hard challenge, right? It is a hard challenge, right? To pray with purity of truth to God, right? And you might think, but if I say the truth, what if it doesn't change the thing? Say the truth for what? Nothing will change what? You know what? That's not the point. The point is if you can speak the truth, you are in your identity as a child of God who has a strong relationship with truth. If everyone else wants to live in their lives, let them live in their lives. You can't change them. All you can do is say, I stand for the truth. And I invite you to stand for it too. And if you don't stand for it, then I know who you are. You are not a child of God. But if you are a child of God, and you're working with another child of God, then hold them to that standard. You too are okay enough to engage with this truth with me. Right? And I recognize, like, I'm supposed to end at 12.20, so let me go into the third. My third point is peace can be planned for. So don't think I am born in a not peaceful family, so I cannot have peace, right? Peace can be planned for, peace can be practiced, and please plan and practice for it. And why should you do that? Because those who plan peace have joy. Peace is correlated to joy. Do you see that? Purity first. Purity of what is the truth of my heart. What is the truth of God. What is the truth of my mind that needs to be said out loud. right? And then, let me go out there and plan and practice this peace with this other person. And if I do that, I will have joy. And if you are living a joyless existence, like, ah, I'm at peace with my husband, but it's not a happy marriage, then there is some dishonesty there, man. Talk about it. It's okay that it's a bit painful in the moment. It's better than you keep all the pain inside here. Then you're not really at peace, right? So put it there. It's going to be a hard moment. Talk through it. It will get better. Okay? So, and I love this verse because it says, whatever you have learned or received or heard, or seen, right, in God or in godly community, put it into practice and trust that the God of peace will be with you. You don't have to be an expert peacemaker, peace builder, mediator, navigator, don't know what, right? You just have to be a child of God who believes my Father, the God of peace, will be with me. He cares about your peace and your joy more than you do. And if you are ready to do the work, He will do the work with you, right? So, <sighs> He is with you. Right? And if you're thinking like, hey, you don't know my situation, okay? My situation is very bad, okay? I got a lot of deceitful people around me, huh? very hard, very hard, right? You know what? Like, just pray for them, do your best to live peaceably with them, right? And let God do this with you. And you should just say what you need to say because do not let the deceitful rob you of much joy. 
the problem with dealing with deceitful other people is sometimes you end up being deceitful as well, right? They deceitful, I deceitful back. Okay, who too can play in this game, right? Why you want to play that game, right? If they want to play that game and be joyless and unhappy people, then you can't stop them. But you don't let them play that game with you and rob you of your joy. God has a more joyful experience for you, right? And let me show you this so that Secular setting, but I think you'll open the eyes of Christian, okay? This is from a marriage counsellor, famous one, but you can see it in any kind of relationship, okay? This guy called Terence Real says, all relationships go through this cycle, happy one, good one, this is normal. The first stage is called harmony. And you know what he says is harmony? Love without knowledge. <laughs> then when I read that, like, wow, wow. <laughs> He says, harmony is called, I love you, but I still, I don't know something about you, right? Then the second stage is this harmony is called, wah, now I know the knowledge. So now I struggle to love you, and now I will separate myself a bit as I try and contemplate this, like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that you're the type who don't know how to put the toilet paper properly. Right? How am I supposed to be happy with you right now? This harmony, right? right? And then the third stage is called repair. Repair is when any attempt any, even like a half-baked attempt, as long as God attempt to love the person despite the new knowledge, right, to unite with the separated and to prevent negativity from escalating, right? If you do a little bit of that, imperfect, never mind. You will slowly go back to harmony again. And then it will happen again and again and again. It's a never-ending cycle. So, uh, just because you got this one occasionally, uh, doesn't mean, oh, let's go divorce right now. No, man. Like, Go and do some repair work. Sometimes uh, people are like, oh, this harmony, I divorce you. Then my next wife, uh, very lovely. Then, oh, again, uh, divorce you. Then, like, oh, you never learn this. This is healthy relationship building. So what happens to a lot of people right, is they get stuck here. They don't know how to repair. So what they do is they fall into this little hell right, called the cycle of disillusionment. And what happens there is, okay, I disharmony with you. Now I'm going to try and control you. Control you, huh? huh? Cannot control, I retaliate. Huh? Retaliate, ah? Huh? Nothing change, ah? Huh? Huh? See it, resign. Right? Then, again and again and again. That's not good. You never do this simple thing called, let me just repair. Right? And to Terry Real, he says the top five losing strategies that people use all the time, even though it doesn't work, is number one, I need to be right. Number two, let me control you. Number three, unbridled self-expression. That means I will say everything and anything without censorship. Number four, retaliation. Number five, withdrawal. It doesn't work. This is research. It don't work. Stop it, right? And if you cycle this for long enough, <laughs> let me reference another very famous marriage therapist called the Gottmans, and they call this, this is their term, it's so funny, the four horsemen of relationship apocalypse, right? which means if you see these four things, it's very, very bad. It's very, very bad. Stage four already, right? Criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling means I don't even want to talk to you. Like, come, darling, let's sit down and talk. Do one. Come on, let's go eat chicken rice. Do one. Right, that's called stonewalling. Contempt. Contempt is the final stage where it's really, really bad. Contempt means I don't even see you as my equal anymore. You are beneath me. You are disgusting. Oh, that one very bad already. Right? So, my hope, children of God, is this is the world <laughs> that you will go through, but take heart, God has overcome the world, right? And He will tell you, and the Bible is full of little tricks of repair. Just do that. Imperfect is also okay. God is with you. Just don't go into that little hell of control, retaliation, and resignation. It don't work. It don't work. Right? Even the world knows that. And if I had to simplify it for you, this cycle is called the game of being in relationship and getting it right together. You know what the other game is called? The other game is called the game of being right. right? And I love this little mantra. Right? You say this to yourself in your head. Okay? If you forget everything that I tell you today, right? just remember, I'm not here to be right. I'm here to get it right. And I'm here to be in relationship with you. 
And if you don't want to be in relationship with me, that's fine, but I'm not here to be right anyway. I just want to get it right with you. So which game do you want to play as a child of God? Right? So my encouragement to you, I think this is my closing slide, is look, it's hard work. It's hard work. Right? Well, I must secure myself, must go and talk to God, must be pure in my heart and mind, and then must repair. Wow, very hard there. Eh? But you will get a harvest of righteousness. Right? And I want you to just see that the game of being in relationship, getting it right, is hard. But the game of being right is harder. You know, all you, you know what you win in there? All you win is the prize called, I was right. That's all you get. Very nice, man. Like, I was right, but now I'm so lonely. <laughs> Nobody want to be friends with me. No joy one, okay? So rejoice, plan for peace, train for peace, and there will be a harvest of righteousness for you, and God will be there for you. You don't have to be an expert. Remember, even the secular therapist says, even imperfect attempts at repair is better than nothing. And if you're a child of God, you have actually a lot of assets working for you. And the number one asset, I will have to tell you, is that simplicity of even if I don't know what to say or do right now and I struggle to love and be at peace with this other person, I want you to remember there is someone called God who is the face that's looking for you. Go and look for him. Let him shine his face of perfect acceptance for you and let him speak the truth in love that you need to hear and then when you're like oh okay after you talk to him then you go and talk to the person don't go and talk to the person first again keep it practical okay and i am good <laughs> yeah, thank you